are the, you know, where are the real minds of change happening in today's culture? Well, I mean, I think the, the easiest place to see it is a place like Silicon Valley, where you have people devoted to making something great and making something new and challenging the way things are done. I think you see it in other places, but that's certainly, I think, the most obvious example of that sort of attitude and approach towards life. And notice it's also one of the most free parts of the economy, mm. one of the least controlled by government. And that's not an accident uh, in my view, and I don't think it would have been in her view. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think one of the other areas uh, today, I mean, <clears throat> part of it is an interesting question in that, in that the kinds of innovations, the kinds of things that are gonna break through like that, we don't, we don't necessarily see. But if you look past, like, I mean, the, the, the sort of internet revolution, one of the really, really interesting things about that is, to me, as you said, yeah, some of these people are kind of coming from the outside, they're not within the mainstream, because, well, they're probably bucking the trend. I mean, they're, they're coming along and they're doing something different. What's really, really interesting about that space in the economy that it, it is free, it's very, very innovative, it's very, very fast paced. What that means is in a way, the, the, the funnel of talent is actually getting much, much bigger. Right before the funnel of talent was was controlled by the elite universities, the the top right. you know the fortune the top fortune companies. It was it was a very clear hierarchy, a path of if you want to be successful, here are the you know twenty different things that are available to you. Now, if you want to be successful, there's an entire world out there for you to do it. And the means, I mean, basically the guys who who took the internet, which was a government project that really had no economic value, and massively translated it into something that people could actually use. I mean, you know. You think back to when people said, "Oh, you know what? You're going to be able to buy and sell stuff. Like, what's this internet thing?" You know, when it first came out, <laughs> people thought, "People thought, when Al Gore yeah, invented yeah, it. yeah, yeah." When Al Gore invented <laughs> it, right? And people thought, "You know, what? What's the usefulness of this?" Like, you know, I mean, I get email, sure. and whatnot, but what's the useful? And people couldn't. I mean, in in the mid '90s, people couldn't even imagine the kinds of value that have been created by basically these tools. Not just the infrastructure itself, but the actual ways of communicating. You know, Twitter, Facebook, any of these things. The the idea of big data that Google kind of innovated, you know, just take take tons of data and find great computer algorithms to go search right. through it and find information that people are applying to all kinds of other things. All this kind of stuff, that innovation, that that funnel as it were, the talent pool can come up from a much, much broader area. You know, you get 15 year old kids writing apps and making millions of dollars. You get people coming out of, you know, people coming out of areas that you don't expect and saying, hey, I've got a better way of doing this. Is there a way that, you know, that I can get it to people? Before, they couldn't get it to people because, you know, a big uh, R&D specialist at some yeah, firm yeah. wasn't going to do it. But now there's a lot more venture capital. There's a lot more, there's really just a lot more dynamism in, in the creative side of the economy where I think that's where you're going to see the talent coming from. And that's where you're going to see people who say, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do the things I want to do. I'm going to, I'm going to live for myself and be the best person I can be and be productive and be happy. And here's where I can do it. You know, yeah. and notice, it, and notice it applies also in the realm of ideas. So before mm -hmm. you had a bunch of gatekeepers, yeah. if you, had to, you had to get this major publisher to think, yeah, your book will sell or something. And so, you know, at this conference, for instance, you had people coming at a high intensity exercise, for example. You'd have to, to get those ideas out there, you basically have to find a major publisher willing to, you know, give Big you time. a deal. Big time. But yeah. where's the market for it? I mean, it the, the fact is everybody can get ideas out there now. And the challenge is you just have to make your ideas much more appealing and work a lot harder to build an audience rather than find your way through a handful of gatekeepers the way that you did say 30 Man, years I'll ago. tell you this, like just even having this conversation because it's so stimulating and like you know, it's really a cool thing. It reminds me of when I was a kid, you know, I was growing up in Orange County and, and uh, listening to NPR and thinking that that was you know, the, yeah. like, but it was so stimulating. It was yeah. like, man, there's like all these great interviews, but I didn't realize how filtered yeah. that was, yeah. Yeah. you know, and how yeah. like one-sided and then moving around and traveling, you're like, whoa, the world is saying a completely yeah. different yeah. thing. I remember yeah. I interviewed these guys and uh, oh, it was such a horrible, horrible thing to say. Um, but I was talking to these homeless guys. I was talking to them about American culture and I said, oh, well, do you have all this hope because, you know, you're homeless? And the guy was just like, Man, he he actually said to me, he's like, man, fuck you. He's <laughs> like, do you realize what you're saying? Do you yeah. realize what yeah. that means? And he, yeah. and he just broke it down. He's like, dude, I have religion. I have these things because that's what I believe in. Yeah. You know, for you who thinks, he just, man, he like totally took me to yeah. school. Yeah. But, but I mean, like, that's the, I mean, that's the thing. Like, you listen to one radio station now, you know, you've got... I mean, this, you know, the yeah. 21 convention. I mean, just <laughs> the space in which people can can create and innovate in intellectual areas. I mean, whether it's book publishing or podcasts or, I mean, 
I don't know, hundreds of different ways yeah. that people are communicating ideas. That that's I mean, to me, that is that's opened up a space, and it's still you know it's still sorting itself out. I mean, people are still figuring out right now. I think the big change that I see is. <laughs> Uh, now that content creation is is basically limitless. I mean, people people now have very very low cost, if cost at all, right. for content creation. Uh, the the big question is, uh, who's going to come in and innovate in a way that actually sort of stabilizes that and senses and, and yes. makes it such that people can search yeah. it, can get what they want. Right. The, you know, sort of content is out Be there. Be the I Google mean, of information. You know, yeah. Darden right. yesterday was talking about how many eBooks are published every day. But but how do you search those? How do you you know? Yeah. Amazon hasn't yet figured it out. Google hasn't figured it out. But people are working on that problem. I know that. Right. I mean, I don't know the people. I don't know what company they're with. It may be some kid in a dorm room. I don't know. But somebody's going to figure out. How do I actually target this information? Get it to the people that want it. Yeah. Figure out a way of actually, in a, in a sense, it's what happens in markets a lot. How do how do you rationalize the market in a way that that actually takes this sort of bubbling up of, in this case, information, and actually gets it to the people that want it? Same thing happened in, let's say, the oil industry in the late 19th century. You know, Rockefeller was a great integrator of all these different production systems, all these different distribution systems, and he said, "Look, oil is an enormously valuable product. Everybody's going to want it if they could just get it." But there's a, like a thousand producers, a thousand refiners. They're they're scattered all over Ohio and Pennsylvania. Yeah. How do I actually figure out the ways of making this system work? And he comes along and he figures out the innovations, and his engineers figure out the innovations. And suddenly he's he's basically giving oil throughout the world. I mean, shipping it all over the world. Hmm. You know, in the space of about 10, 15, 20 years, he's come along from like what is basically just. Uh, a kind of random market to transforming the whole energy industry. And that same thing is happening now. I don't think it's happened yet because I still see a lot of churn in that kind of marketplace. You know, are sort of uh, pu published on demand or ebooks or like what's actually going to sort out as the way to get content out there. Right. But it's so, the pipeline is just so much bigger. There's a lot. It's yeah. so much bigger than what, you know, than what you had publishers doing, you know, 20 years ago yeah. where, you know, each house would come out with maybe 100 books a year. I mean, now it's like 100 books an hour, uh, you know, or whatever it is. I mean, it's probably even more than that, you know, just the, the kind of content creation stuff. And you think about all those lost opportunities. I mean, that's what I always think about. It's, it's the things that you don't see, right? I mean, a great example of this, I always think about uh, when people talk about the productivity uh, of an economy. And if the economy is, is regulated, controlled, or I mean, even take the 19th century, you know, south, right? Slave labor. You know, slave labor adds certain input to the economy, but you think about all of the ideas, all of the kinds of creativity that, that slaves could have come up with, but that was prohibited to them by law. Mm -hmm. You think today, the, the gatekeepers, right, you know, which some are enforced by law, some are just you know, informal institutions, but all of the stuff, all of the novels that were written that just sat on somebody's bookshelf because nobody wanted to publish it. Well, Ayn Rand's The Founder yeah, was rejected, uh, yeah, rejected by, by like 12, 12 publishers. publishers. Yeah, yeah, yeah you just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you just, you just think about all of the, all of the people who, I mean, and whether it's somebody like Stephanie Meyer or you know Twilight Books or, or something else. I mean, look, great hey, books, yeah, great, yeah, yeah, great no doubt. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, but, but obviously tapping into something that was incredibly desired by yeah. you know 13 year old girls, I guess. But the idea is that. In 20 years ago, that would have never worked for her, right? I mean, she's now right. a multimillionaire, yeah. you know, yeah. a movie franchise, mm -hmm. a whole book, you know, a whole book series. All of that stuff's possible because she was able to take something that otherwise would have just sat on her shelf and say to somebody, you know, like, hey, do you think this works? And now it's not that it's not that really really tight gatekeepers. It's now people who are willing to take risks.